In a previous lecture, we discussed how binary variables can be used with sets of linear constraints to turn them on or off. And so as an example of this, uh, we might have three different binary variables, b1, b2, and b3. And depending on whether these binary variables are 0 and 1, they turn on sets of equations. So for example, maybe if b1 is true or equal to 1, then we have a1x is less than or equal to b. If b2 is true, maybe we have a2x is less than or equal to b2. And maybe if b3 is true, we have a3x is less than or equal to b3. Now, we might have some more complicated logic that says either b1 or b2 have to be true, or b3 have to be true. And when I say or here, I guess what I mean is this is actually an XOR. Okay. So what do I mean by that? So if b3 is equal to 1, then what we're going to do is um, not only will a3x be less than or equal to b3, but we're going to say that b1 has to be equal to 0 and b2 has to be equal to 0. Um, conversely, so else if b3 equals 0, then what we're going to require is that b1 can be uh, true or b2 can be true or both can be true. Okay. So another way we could say this is that b1 plus b2 is greater than or equal to 1. Now, with b1 and b2, they're going to generate their own linear constraints, again, which was a1x less than or equal to b and a2x less than or equal to b. So we could write this as if b1 is equal to 1, get that. this requires that a1x is less than or equal to b1, and if b2 is equal to 1, this implies a2x is less than or equal to b2. Okay. Now, how would we write this in Cplex? Well, we'd sort of have to change all these um, if statements to indicator constraints. Right? So indicator constraints, um, we basically just drop the if and keep everything else looking the same. So we would literally write, and I'm going to write it in order of the binary variables, b1 is equal to 1 implies and here we might have 5x1 plus 3x2 is less than or equal to 6. We could then say something like b2 is equal to 1 implies 3x1 plus 5x2 is less than or equal to 6. The third constraint, b3, we would say something like, well, if b3 is equal to 1, then b1 plus b2 is equal to 0. Now, this sort of implies that if b1 or b2 is 1, then b3 has to be 0. Now, certainly you could just double check and ensure uh, that that's the case by writing um, you could say something like, oh, why is my pen? B3 equals 0 implies that B1 plus B2 is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so that means basically one of these binary variables has to be true if B3 is false. last thing we'd want to write is maybe we have a set of constraints associated with B3 as well. 
that we might have 4x1 plus 4x2 is less than or equal to 4. Okay. So this is how we normally think about indicator constraints. So these are called CPLEX indicator constraints. All right. Now, these indicator constraints can only be used actually in a few different CPLEX interfaces. So if you're working in Java, Python, C++, or MATLAB, MATLAB, To interface with CPLEX, you can use these indicator constraints. You can actually also use the interactive optimizer uh, and use indicator constraints. Now, the problem is in this class, we use the optimization studio. Okay, so, and the problem is the CPLEX optimization studio. does not use indicator constraints. All right, so this is a, an important point. Instead, they use something called logical constraints. Okay, so, and, so, CPLEX Optimization Studio, uses logical constraints. Okay. These are actually really similar to the indicator constraints, but actually a little bit more general. Now, what ends up happening though, is that these logical constraints end up getting converted to indicator constraints. So for those of you who go very deep into optimization, it's gonna be kind of important to understand how you sort of write out these logical constraints so that you don't make your problem more complicated than it needs to be. And we'll sort of go through a few examples so you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. And the issue becomes um, these logical constraints, as they get converted to indicator constraints, they're going to generate some additional binary variables. So even though you might write out, um, let's say, this problem using logical constraints where you have three binary variables, What's going to end up happening is when you write it using um, logical constraints and it switches over to indicator constraints, you'll actually end up with the three original binary variables you started with and then five more binary variables, give or take, I think that's usually what happens, one for each constraint. Right? And that becomes really problematic if you have a lot of constraints, you could be potentially making your problem much harder for CPLEX to solve. Um, because typically every binary constraint you have makes the problem harder and harder. Okay, so let's sort of talk about these logical constraints and understand what they look like. All right. So the first thing to know about these logical constraints is that they're built using a set of operators. All right. So, right. And these logical constraint operators are sort of the standard logical operators that you use, um, you know, in electrical engineering or math and stuff like that. Um, they consist of AND, and that's a, a really bad drawing of an ampersand. 
So if you ever want to write and, you put two ampersands together. If you want to do or, you use two pipes. So this is the symbol. Um, if you do shift backslash, that will give you pipes. That's or. Um, we have not with an exclamation point, or also called the bang. And we also have implies. So there's like an equal sign with, an, uh, with a greater than symbol. And the last two constraints are not equal to and equal to. So we can use um, logical constraints to do all sorts of sort of funny things. So if we were to take our previous problem, I'm going to take this guy, um, we can certainly write this using logical constraints. And it's actually going to look fairly similar to how we would write out our binary constraints. Let me paste this right here. I'm going to shrink it down. All right, so here goes how we would write something using binary constraints. Or indicator, sorry, indicator constraints. Now, there's one important rule about indicator constraints is that this value on the right where you have your binary variable has to be some binary variable equals one or some binary variable equals zero. Um, all right. Now, we're gonna compare how we can write out logical constraints and for the most part, they're actually gonna look very similar. So at the base level, they're almost gonna be the exact same. So here goes the logical constraints. So in fact, the first set of constraints will look the exact same. So we could say B1 being true gives us 5x1 plus 3x2 less than or equal to 6. We could do the same thing um, for the other constraint. That's going to look the exact same. Now what starts getting different are these last three constraints. So we can actually write them in a slightly different way if we wanted to. So instead of introducing this B3 binary variable, what we could do is sort of use a fuller use of these logical constraints. We could say something like, um, if b1 equals 1 and, and there's a double ampersand b2 equals 1 then this implies 4x1 plus 4x2 is less than or equal to 4. Oops, and actually I wrote this wrong, this should be 0. And this would actually give us the same set of constraints. And what you can see here, right, and if you'd like, you could put parentheses around that. Cplex can handle that. What you can see here is unlike logical constraints, I can actually have a more complicated like logical statement or logical test on the left-hand side. Okay, so in the optimization studio, I can do something like this. I can't do that in the um, 
the interactive optimizer. Okay, so only in OPL, the optimization programming language, can I do something like this. All right, if I was using the interactive optimizer, I'd have to use indicator constraints. Now, there are actually other neat ways that we can use indicator constraints. So let me show you another one. So let's say um, I wanted to say something like, uh, I had a binary variable that would indicate whether or not, um, let's say, if the binary variable uh, b1 is equal to 1, then this means x is greater than or equal to 7. Okay. Actually, let me move this over. And maybe I have something that says if b2 is equal to 1, then this implies y is less than or equal to 5. And if b3 is equal to 1, z is greater than or equal to 5. Okay. Now, one thing we might say is that um, some combination of b1, b2, and b3 have to be true. So we could say something like, you know, b1 plus b2 plus b3 is greater than or equal to 1. So this would be the same equivalent statement as saying um, x is greater than or equal to 7 or y is less than or equal to 5 or z is greater than or equal to 5. All right. So these four lines are logically equal to that statement. Now, the nice part is that in OPL, when we're using Optimization Studio, again, we're not restricted to writing the logical constraints as some binary variable equals 1 or some binary variable equals 0. We could actually have more complicated statements that imply a set of constraints. So let's sort of think about how we could actually write this. And in fact, we can write what we have here as our constraint. So in Cplex, if you had this constraint where one of these um, constraints had to be true, you instead of writing these indicator variables, you could just say, oops, x is greater than or equal to 7, or using the double bar notation, y is less than or equal to 5, or z is greater than or equal to 5. And in fact, that's all you need to write in Cplex, and it will figure out that one of those statements has to be true. So these, that single line is equivalent to those four lines. So that's one nice little feature about using the logical constraints. Another way that we could do the logical constraints is by using what we call sometimes a counting technique. And it looks a little bit similar um, to the indicator constraints. So we could also say something like x is greater than or equal to 7 plus y is less than or equal to 5 plus z is greater than or equal to 5 and that's greater than or equal to 1. So again, these two statements are the same, and they both make use of logical constraints. So what I'm underlining here are the logical constraints that we're using. Okay. And then I'm performing some sort of logic operation. So we can use ORs, but that's just equivalent of doing a plus. Right? Um, we could certainly do AND statements if we wanted as well to make whatever complicated logic that we'd like. Right. So let's sort of see this in practice using Cplex. And I'm going to build through a few different problems. And what I want to share with you is what is the linear program that gets generated? Okay, so I'm going to switch over to um, Cplex. And you can see here I already have a configuration and 
I have this file called myfirstlogical.mod. Okay. So let's sort of see what we can do. All right. So let's start with um, maybe this last problem. So let's say I'm going to have three decision variables, and we can make them all floats, positive floats. So we'll have x, y, and z. And let's say we wanted to minimize x plus y plus z. And it's going to be subject to the constraint that I listed here. Okay. So one of these has to be true. In fact, maybe actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust this constraint a little bit um, because this one's problematic. I'm going to change this to y is greater than or equal to 15. Let's see what else. Yeah, everything else is going to stay the same. Okay, so let's sort of see how we can do this. So let's write out these constraints. So one way we could do these constraints is we could say um, x is greater than or equal to 7, or y, oops, y is greater than or equal to 15, or z is greater than or equal to, did I use 20, I think? So, oh, I also used 5 there. Okay. okay. So it ends up that we can run this as an optimization. So let's go ahead and see what ends up happening. Um, it should make sense that all the x and y will end up being 0, and z will be 5, and that will actually minimize x plus y plus z. And sure enough, that's what we get. Um, again, we could have written this differently. So another way to write this logical constraint is we could say, instead of the ors, we could do pluses. Right? So each time one of these is true, it's going to be 1. It's going to be equal to a value of 1. Okay, so actually, let me... I'm just going to comment this out. Just so we know that these are all sort of the same ways that we can write it. Okay, but now, since we're doing sort of these adding, we have to say um, it's greater than or equal to 1. Okay. So again, before we got 0, 0, 5, uh, what we can see is we'll end up getting the same result. Hopefully, yep, 0, 0, 5. Um, the second way is a little bit nice because sometimes we could do things like two of these logical statements have to be true, right? Um, and in the latter, in the, the former case where we, we use the logical or, it was a little bit harder to do. So here, if we want two of them being true, um, we get five and seven. So, you know, I think that's a little bit easier. Certainly we could do that the other way um, by saying, ooh, how can we do this? Well, we'd have to go through all six combinations. So this gets a little bit harder. So there might be an easier, let's see. We might be able to do something like I'm going to write this as a, here. So I'm going to sort of explain what I'm going to do. So having two of them be true, at least two of them being true, means that not all of them are false or not one of them is false. Um, so how could we do that? Um, ooh, actually, this is a little bit tricky. So I don't think there is a good way. Um, so let's sort of think about this. So I'm going to write three logical statements. And we can go through all their combinations and see if it satisfies what we want. So we could have true, 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 false, 
true, false, true, true, false, 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 true, true, false, true, false, 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 true, and finally false, false, false. Okay. So again, we need to find a statement where two of them are true. So that, oops. Okay. So this guy's, that works, that works, that works. Um, the next line does not work. This works and that's it. So again, um, false, false doesn't work. False, false doesn't work. False, false and false, false, false doesn't work. So we want to find a way to make, um, the, the four that are checked true to be true. Um, and this ends up being a little bit less clean than if we were to do the um, mathematical statement that we see here. Yeah, so unfortunately I can't think of a quick way to do this. So um, it seems like the only way to write it out in this logical statement would be to go through every single option. So we could have um, x is greater than 0 and y is greater than 15. So we can put these together in one logical statement. Alternatively, and the neat thing about these logical statements is we can put them on other lines. We can have x greater than 7 be true and z greater than 5. The other option would be y greater than 15 and z greater than 5 and there is lastly one more um, which would be let's see well, which one am i missing oh that they're all true Oops, that should not be there Okay, so um, this much longer logical constraint is the same as what I had written on line 14. So actually, let's see if we get the same answer. Um, and sure enough, we do. So you can see there are advantages to doing sort of this counting method um, if you'd like to do it. Um, so again, there's sort of a whole bunch of different ways that we can perform these logical constraints. Alrighty, so um, that's sort of a primer on logical constraints. But one thing that's also worth doing is looking at what is the generated LP file that Cplex actually solves. So when you type in here, this actually isn't what Cplex solves. It actually programs it into a different implementation. So it's worth sort of saying how Cplex implements these different versions. So I'm going to comment this out. And let's sort of start with this first problem where we said x1 or x is greater than or equal to 7, y is greater than or equal to 15, or z is greater than or equal to 5. All right, so I'm going to run this. And I sort of have my configuration set up so that it generates an LP file. Um, that LP file is called configuration1.lp and we can sort of see what what ends up happening here. So here's the LP file and what it ends up doing is introducing a bunch of new binary variables to indicate to serve as indicator variables for each of the logical constraints. Okay. So um, you can see X, Y, Z are my original variables. And what it's going to do is it's going to create three additional variables, X4, X5, X6. 
each of these variables is going to correspond to one of these logical tests. So x greater than or equal to 7, y greater than or equal to 15, or z greater than or equal to 5. Okay, So if x4 is true, it's going to imply, and in fact, the indicator constraints can sort of go both directions, which is kind of neat. Um, it's going to imply that x is greater than or equal to 7. Right? Um, for x5 being true, that's going to imply y is greater than or equal to 15. And for x6 being true, that's going to imply z is greater than or equal to 5. Um, so this is pretty, and one of those has to be true. Um, this is pretty much how we learned to use indicator constraints previously when we were talking about writing up a problem. Um, and again, this is sort of an LP format that you would program using the interactive optimizer, not the optimization studio. Okay. So um, if you were to sort of use the, I don't have it set up, but um, yeah. All right, so let's sort of change our problem to see how it now looks a little bit different if we are to use one of the other constraints. So um, I'm going to mark this out. And one of the other ways we wrote it was like this. All right, so let's see what happens. So I'm going to save it and go ahead and run. And I think the LP will end up looking the same. So let's sort of watch that happen. Okay, so it ended up solving 005. That's what we got before. And now if we look at the LP, we actually see it. It actually ended up writing it the exact same way. Okay, now we had another way of using the logical constraints. So one thing that we could do is we could say, well, let's introduce some uh, decision variables that are binary variables. And of course, we can, when we define them, we call them Booleans. So maybe we have B1, B2, and B3. And we might say something like um, B1 is equal to 1. That implies X is greater than or equal to 7. We can do the same thing for B2 and B3. Um, replacing these values as we should. And the only requirement we then have to add on is B1 plus B2 plus B3 is greater than or equal to 1. So this more or less looks like we're using indicator constraints. But in fact, these are all logical constraints um, as interpreted by OPL. So let's go to... Uh, run this and take a look at what ends oops, forgot the semicolon there what ends up happening and again this is the exact same formulation as just using these two one-liners okay, so we see z is equal to 5 b3 is equal to 1 now if you look at the generated LP all of a sudden it looks way more complicated what Cplex ended up doing is it added additional binary variables. So before we just had B1, B2, and B3. Right? It's now added X4, X6, um, ooh, X12, X10. I have no idea how this numbering, yeah, X10. Yeah, so it's got a whole bunch. I don't know where X5 is. Did it make an X5? No, it didn't. It seems to have skipped that. Um, so it created all these new binary variables. And again, what ends up happening is each binary variable is being used for each of the logical tests. So the first logical test is, is B1 equal to 1? Is B2 equal to 1? Is B3 equal to 1? So there's just something to be aware of that if you set up your binary variables in this way, you're going to end up generating even more binary variables. Now, um, there is good news that if you look at what Cplex is doing, so again, B1 generates, or sorry, let me be, this B1 equal equal 1 test, that logical test ends up generating 
a binary variable x4. But the relief is that the cplex constraint says that b1 is equal to x4, b2 is equal to x7, and b3 is equal to x10. So even though new binary constraints were set, the constraint equations that relate these binary variables are very simple. And what cplex is going to be able to do is it's going to be able to do the substitutions to understand that, hey, uh, x4 is the same thing as b1, and x7 is the same thing as b2, and x10 is the same thing as b3. And it will actually do a simplification before it solves the problem. Um, so again, you know, for our small problems, this doesn't really make a big difference. But if we had something very large, it would, it potentially might. Um, certainly, we could do this other problem where we require that two of these uh, constraints hold true. So we could certainly solve that. And you see it again, we get x equals 7, uh, z equals 5. So this is more or less how we can use logical constraints. Um, we have a lot of flexibility in how we use them. They end up being a more general version of the indicator constraints that I discussed in a previous lecture.